Hey, you're going to have to save that for eight later. <laughs> She's not stopping. She just keeps going. She just keeps going. Yeah, come sit down. <laughs> it's not your fault. I got going in Sunday school, and then I realized it was five minutes till, and I'm like, oh my goodness, nobody stopped me. So I don't know if you were afraid to stop me or if uh, it was so captivating that you couldn't stop. I don't know, whatever it was. But we're here, and we're going to worship, and we're going to uh, celebrate each other's presence. Um, I don't have any announcements that I can think of. Does anybody want to correct me on that? Okay. Happy New Year. It's good to be. Oh, there. You did it because he's not here. I sent him on an errand. So, yes. Not, not to get him out of that, but uh, yeah, he's... <sighs> I don't, I don't know, I mentioned that last week about how uh, um, I got the senior discount at, uh, the, at the hair salon. Now I've got a 17-year-old son. Thank you. Yeah, so. But uh, pay attention to your bulletin and your, uh, and your uh, bridge for announcements and things. Carlene, could you come and begin our service? Good morning and welcome. I sometimes get the senior discount thing too, John. Don't worry about it. <laughs> this follows you along. Just want to welcome everybody being here. Um, if you're here for the first time, welcome. If you're looking for a church home, you're really more than welcome. And we hope that you would consider coming and joining with us. Um, this is the second Sunday of this new year, and we're still thinking about changes. Um, last Sunday, John talked with us about Paul and Silas going out and teaching a new way. I mean, that's coming from Acts, and here we have a Holy Spirit, and we have Jesus Christ who's died on the cross for us. And all of this information has to go out, go forward, and be taught. And um, I'm thankful that they were there and that they did their job. Disciple, I learned, and John has taught this many times, the definition of disciple is a disciplined learner. And then a follower from the heart a whole follower, a wholesome follower from the heart. So as you learn and you get deeper in the word, it's just rich. I can't tell you how exciting that is. And I've come to this church about six years ago now. And as it gets deeper, man, is it better. And this last week in Bible study, or studying First Peter, came across the verse third chapter 15th verse it says but in your hearts honor christ the lord is holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and respect and i've got to share with you about a little after i started coming on a regular basis. I'm coming back from Emmett with a friend of mine after taking a riding clinic. And she's well-read, well-learned. She's a high school teacher in history and government. And I don't know how it came up, but the Bible came up and she said, that's just a storybook. I about dropped my teeth. And I didn't know what to say. You know, I think of all these folks who can just talk scriptures and I just go, oh. <laughs> okay, but I knew I had to say something. And I told her, I'm sorry you feel that way. 
I am a believer. I do believe the Bible. And I left it at that. And I felt somewhat inadequate at that. But I'm wondering today, what would God say about me? If he's asked about me. Oh, thought about this this morning before I came. And I can tell you that as a believer, I know I'm valued. He sent his son. He put him on that cross to prepare a way home for me. And I know that. I know that as a result of Jesus' work on that cross, I'm wholly blameless and pure in his sight. And that's big. And I have been adopted into sonship. I am, you know how good that feels? I mean, I'm just part of this greater family. It's awesome. And I know that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. And I'm so thankful for that song when I was growing up. And so as I look back with what I said to my friend, it was just enough because I will share with you, she still asks me questions. And she's getting closer. And I'm thankful for that. And so, as we have the opportunity to be discipled learners and wholesome followers of Christ and go forward, I think that's kind of it. And let me tell you, it felt pretty uncomfortable in that truck that day. I was like, what do I say? It took something for me to say something. And I'm glad that I did. I knew I couldn't let it go unsaid. So with that, let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for letting us all be here today. Your family of God, together, the church representing you. Lead us, guide us, direct us as we are here to learn and to share in all that you say and do and are. We thank you for loving us. Amen. Okay. Do I have a song? Oh, you want the scripture next? Let me do the scripture. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return it without, making, without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that it goes from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent. Good morning, if you'd all stand with me. We are gonna start with To God Be the Glory on 102.
best offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son. book we're on 544 for trust and obey when we walk with the lord in the light of his word what a glory he sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with the still
They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and the bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we bring you these gifts and offerings to be put to your use and for furthering your direction for us. Thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thanks, Carleen. I'd like to invite the kids forward. Good morning. All right. I've got something in my hand here. Uh, you guys know what those are? Go ahead. Oh, boy, you knew exactly what they were. You've seen those before? They're sharp. They're sharp. I'm, being, I'm not going to put them down there. Somebody might step on them. Why do they call them goat heads? Because they're a goat. Well, they, if you look at the seed, it kind of... Kind of looks like a little goat with two little horns and a chin on it. See it? But they're also, what else do they call these? Puncture vine. Because it punctures things like your feet and your hands and your bicycle tire and all that other stuff. Now, I want it to uh, puncture. It means poke a hole in something. Does it, would these poke a hole in your hand? They might, yeah. Now, I'm going to talk to you today about perseverance. That's a big word. It also, maybe persistence. Is that one? You ring a bell for it? How about stick to Have you guys ever done something that's really, really hard and that took a long time to do? What was that? Um, math worksheets. <laughs> math worksheets. Oh, yeah. I don't know. How many, how many problems can they put on one page, right? It just keeps going and going and going. And you have to work really hard to, to get to the end of it. How about you guys? You ever do something that required some perseverance? No? no, no. no? You just, everything's like that for you? No. Nothing hard. How about putting up with your sister? That might require some perseverance too. She's wonderful. But she's out there right now. So, yeah. That happens sometimes. So, perseverance, that means that you do something hard like a math worksheet and you stick to it until you get done. Now, these seeds, these, the plants that grow out of these are an annual, which means they only grow once a year, the seed grows up. But you know what? The seeds themselves can grow, and I checked this out. I, I don't know, you all have heard about puncture vines being viable for a million years. Yeah, they're not, but it feels like it, doesn't it? Five years is what they say that these seeds can last five years before they sprout. So the seeds themselves have perseverance. But you know what else? You want to hold one? Are you serious? All right, don't poke yourself with it. It takes perseverance to get rid of puncture vines. You have to keep working at it and keep working at it. There was a gentleman that went to church here a while back. His name was Martin Gobby. And he would go out around our church and, and take care of puncture vines. He would pull up puncture vines and pull up puncture vines. And he persevered to the point we hardly had any. But then somebody brought some more in and then they grew again. And it's really hard to get rid of them. Oh, yeah. Now, what I want you guys to think about is that perseverance, sticking to something, working through your math homework, <laughs> is important because 
Good things come when we persevere, when we stick to it and get through it. Now, I know that's kind of hard when you're young, but as you get older, it gets even more important. So I want to encourage you to practice your perseverance. Paul talks about that in the Bible, about us as Christians persevering. And Paul? Oh, man, who's Paul? You need to ask your folks in, in children's church. And don't let them go until they tell you, okay? All right. So persevere. Keep to it. Stay the course. And good things will happen for you, okay? Right now. Dear Lord, we thank you for giving us examples in nature. And we thank you for giving us the strength to persevere, whether it be with our math homework or getting rid of puncture vines or following you even when the times get tough. So we ask that you would give us the strength to stick to it and do the right thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, thank you. Do you want to take these? No. No. <laughs>
Last week I gave the kids chocolate, and this week I tried to give them puncture vine. I don't, I didn't quite have their attention this week like I did last week. There's a lesson there for me, I'm sure. I want to invite you to turn to the first letter to the Thessalonians in your Bible for our reading this morning. I'm going to read basically the first chapter. It begins like this. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We always give thanks to God for all of you and mention you in our prayers, constantly remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord had sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak about it. For the people of whose regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath that is coming. I want to start today by telling two stories of exploration. The first... It's no secret that the conquistadors came to the New World looking for gold. They'd settle for silver, but gold was the real prize. But by the early 1500s, all of the low-hanging fruit had already been picked. And so when a shipwrecked wanderer named Cabeza de Vaca wandered into Mexico City with a story of Cibola, the mythical seven cities of gold somewhere to the north, Coronado couldn't resist. Leading an expedition of about 300 soldiers, he butchered his way into the desert southwest until he finally stumbled across a a Zuni village that his guide, Marcos de Nisa, assured him was Cibola. Unfortunately for everyone, there was no gold. The natives were massacred and de Nisa barely escaped with his life. Coronado sent him packing back to Mexico And he found himself a new guide, an enslaved native that he started to call the Turk. This new guide told Coronado that there was an even bigger city, an even richer city, further to the north, called Kivira. By this point, Coronado was committed, and so he followed the Turk north and north and north into what would become today's Kansas only to find that he'd been tricked. You see, his captive guide had been told to make up the story in order to leave Coronado into the wilderness, hopefully to be lost and to die. Now, the second story is probably one you're more familiar with. It's the story of Lewis and Clark and their journey into the wilderness, their expedition into the Pacific Northwest. Around 1800, a group of Hadassah Indians captured a young salmon eater, Shoshone girl named Sacagawea. After a year with the Hadassah, this Shoshone girl was traded or sold or won in a card game. Nobody really knows the story, but eventually she came to live with a Quebecois trapper named Charbonneau, who made her his wife. While they were staying with the Mandan tribe in the winter of 1804, Lewis and Clark uh, secured Charbonneau and, his, uh, and Sacagawea as well as, as interpreters. Now, if you've read the journals, you know that Charbonneau himself was something of a wash. He, he kind of added, he kind of didn't. But Sacagawea proved to be invaluable to the Corps of Discovery. A big difference between the Corps of Discovery and Coronado's disaster was the quality of their guides. 
Both Coronado's captive guide and Sacagawea had plenty of local knowledge. They knew the lay of the land. They knew where they were going. But Sacagawea seemed actually committed to the success of the captains, while the native that led Coronado north wanted him dead. Two different goals there, certainly. A lot depends on your guide. The Thessalonians were starting out on an expedition, too. They were invited to enter into this new thing, to explore this future as followers of Jesus. And there was a lot of promise involved, a lot uh, that excited them. There was, even though there was that promise, there was still some uncertainty that accompanied this journey. Last week when we started this series, we talked a little about how Paul and Silas and Timothy came to Thessalonica and how they founded the church there. We talked about the problems that had been stirred up by the Thessalonian Jews about that ruffian-filled mob that they incited to drive Paul and his companions out of town. Now, that's where I want to pick up the story today. I want you to imagine yourself there in Thessalonica. I want you to imagine yourself as a member of this ecclesia. The Greek word means assembly, this gathering of people that had heard this message of the gospel that Paul was proclaiming, and they'd responded favorably. They, they accepted it. Maybe, maybe you're a devout Gentile, somebody who was a God-fearer. Maybe you were a reasonable Jew who was won over by Paul's arguments. Maybe you were one of those influential woman, women who became a patron of the church, the ones that Luke tells us about. Maybe you were once a follower of more pagan practices, Worshipping all of the required idols and at the appropriate temples. Who knows? Whatever your history, though, now you're part of something new. Something different. And things are going pretty good. You're pretty excited about it. There's a lot happening. Well, there is until that ruffian-filled mob. Now, the one who is leading you, your guide, he's gone. Paul is gone, Silas is gone, Timothy is gone. They've all been run out of town, and there's still questions. You're still wondering about what it means to be the church, and these questions, they need some answers. Now, it's hard for us now to reconstruct the timeline of these. The authors didn't put a little date in the upper right-hand corner of their manuscript, or if they did, it's, it's long gone So we don't really know the exact breakdown of these things. Paul could have been in in Thessalonica for as little as a month, maybe two months, maybe three months, not a long time. Once he moves on from there, once he's run out of town and goes to Berea, he he gets shuffled around pretty quickly. He goes to Athens, then on to Corinth and so forth, and he stays in Corinth for quite a while. But all the while, Paul is wondering. He's, he's concerned with what's going on in Thessalonica. He had to leave so abruptly. He's like, I don't know. What, do they know everything they need to know? He's wondering about this. At some point, he sends Timothy. Timothy goes up to, to do a little recon, to check things out, to see how they're progressing. And Timothy comes back with a report. And that's what leads to this letter. It may have been only a matter of months after he was unceremoniously run out of town in this letter. Whatever the timeline, though, what we see here in this letter, it's a bit of a report. We see it reflected how things are going in Thessalonica, what Paul wants for the church. Now, you know Paul. Well, maybe we don't know Paul. Who's Paul? Paul was a well-educated man. He had a good training in these things. He was a master of the techniques of letter writing in his day. And so the letter that we read here in Thessalonians, it's got all of the essential elements, if you will. He's experienced enough with it that he can mess around, he can tinker with it. He knows when to bend the rules, when they can be broken. And if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I can hook you up with a commentary on it or whatever. It's, there, there's people that have written chapters on Paul's letter writing rhetoric. It's, it's interesting if you're into it. I'm not going to go into all that. I'm just going to tell you a couple things. First, the greeting, the first verse that we see, the first one we read, it's pretty standard. You've got the sender, Paul, Savannah, Silas, and Timothy, to the recipient, the ecclesia, the church, the assembly of the Thessalonians, and then the greeting. 
Now, Paul puts a particular Christian stamp on it. We see there he ties that word assembly, ecclesia, to God the Father and and Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to make sure that we understand this from the very beginning. This body, this gathering, this assembly, this ecclesia of people in Thessalonica, it is an assembly in God, in our Lord Jesus Christ. It is called together together. By God. It is created by Jesus. It finds its identity in the Holy Spirit. First verse. That's where we get that information. The next part of the letter that we come to is what is known as the Thanksgiving section. In letters of the time, it would usually be pretty short a paragraph, maybe a sentence or two. Paul stretches it out quite a bit, and he puts again that profoundly Christian stamp on it. Uh, In Thessalonians, some commentators say it stretches all the way into the third chapter. It's a long, formal thanksgiving. And it's not just a formality either. It illustrates some really key spiritual principles. It's not something that you're supposed to brush over to get on to the body of the letter, which which you might do with another letter of the day. It's, it's, It's important. On the surface, when we read it, we see something of an account This is how this all played out. This is how it all happened. This is how the gospel came to Thessalonica and how it was received. Paul says, I've heard about your faith. I've heard that it's good. I heard you're doing good stuff. I've heard about your love and your hope. He gives thanks to God for it. You've heard those three words before, I'm sure. Faith, love, hope. It's the order here. We've also heard uh, other different orders in Paul's letter. That, That trio is very important to him. He gives thanks to God. And I want you to note, too, that he attaches this idea of labor, work, to each of the L of these qualities. Their their work of faith, their labor of love, their steadfastness, their endurance, their perseverance of hope. We'll pick that up later as we get deeper into the letter. What comes next, though? I think what comes next, really, we need to attend to it. We need to pay attention to it. It might be easy for us to brush past it, move on to more important issues. It's just introductory material, but it's actually pretty important. Now, Paul writes, and we can assume that Silas and Timothy had a hand in the production of the letter, too. Paul writes, For we know, brothers and sisters, beloved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our message of the gospel came to you not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. So just as you know what kind of persons we prove to be among you for your sake. That's some pretty heavy stuff in there. It's not just some fancy spiritual sounding language here. It's, It's important theology. Paul's trying to be clear that all of this, everything that he's heard about in Thessalonica, everything that's going on there, all of it comes from God. We saw it in the very first verse. This is the church in God, in our Lord Jesus Christ. It all comes from God. He he roots everything that happens in the church in God's will and God's power. God's at the center of the whole thing. The people of Thessalonica are beloved by God. They are chosen by God. Seriously, you need to let that sink in a little bit. That's amazing stuff. This is not some full-body doctrine of predestination when we talk about the word chosen here. This is a simple blessed fact that God has chosen God loves who God loves. God chooses who God chooses. Now, I'm a big believer in God's all-encompassing love. I think that that's the scope of God's love. I don't think John would have wrote in his gospel that God so loved the world if he didn't include the world in that, if he was trying to say that, well, just these people. I don't think that's what God is intending when he intends to love us. So even those that don't respond to the gospel, they're still loved by God. And God's choice, God's choice is not a limiting choice either. This is a poetic way that Paul has to illustrate the fact that God knows. 
God has always known. God has known before the foundations of the world. He's known about you. He's known about you. From before time, God has known who's going to respond. God has chosen them. We don't know. That's not up to us. Our, our human understanding, it's too limited. We, we can't get it there. But there's something wonderful about this. Something miraculous about this. About God's foreknowledge of my salvation. Of your salvation. I mean, that's amazing. You think, you know, you get, you're born, you go through your life, you do the things that you do, and, and that's about it. But no, you are placed in history at this point, known by God from before time and loved by God from before time. That's how important you are. That's awesome. It's a wonderful thing. But he goes on. So you take a look at, the, at verse 6 there, the next line here. It's also pretty important. It, it gets at this idea that, that we're talking about, about moving into this unknown future. Now this is an early letter. This is probably the earliest thing that's produced that, that it has found its way into our New Testament. The very first thing written down. But even at this very early point, maybe only maybe 10, 20 years after Jesus, even at this point, Paul is already deep into this idea that the Christian will be connected to the suffering of Jesus. I know, it's like, oh no, he's talking about suffering. <laughs> it's not exciting, I know, I don't really want to hear about this, but it's Paul, we've got to, we've got to follow it. He's going to talk about it in a lot more detail later in some of his other letters, but he's under no illusion, even at this early point, that the Christian life is not an easy life. Now, some of this might come from his own education. This is a, a person who was very well aware of the prophet Isaiah. And I know you've probably heard this. We say it at Christmas. We read it at Easter, the passage from Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our distresses. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities upon him the punishment was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed paul is completely convinced that the prophet is talking about jesus here he knows it he knows that this is jesus who has been crushed for our iniquities and bruises by his bruises we are healed Paul is convinced in the redemptive suffering of Jesus, something that Paul knows that Jesus himself claimed. And Paul is deeply committed to living in solidarity with Jesus. Basically, if, Jesus, if that's the way Jesus lives, that's the way I want to live. If Jesus suffers, I want to suffer. That's what Paul says. I mean, he's very explicit about it. If this is the way that Jesus goes, that's the way that I want to go. If Jesus suffers redemptively, then Paul is going to embrace that redemptive suffering with open arms. He'll even boast about it, which he does. So it's no surprise for Paul that the Christian life comes with a little bit of suffering. Maybe a lot of suffering. It's what leads him to say in 2 Corinthians 1.7 that our hope for you is unshaken, Corinthian church, for we know that as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our consolation. But for the most part, suffering for the Christian comes after accepting the gospel. I mean, that's logical, right? That makes sense sense you get the joy of salvation you get that wonder of being forgiven you get all of that excitement about being a part of something new being adopted into the family of God the promises they all become real and exciting to you and then well because the world hates the servant as much as it hates the master uh, the persecution starts and it's that joy and that love and that hope that carries us through those difficult times as we share in the suffering, we also share in the consolation, as Paul says. But that's not what we are told here in the letter to the Thessalonians. Paul doesn't say, you received the word with joy, 
And then the persecution started. Now, we read Luke's account in Acts, and that's kind of what we see. It's what it looks like. The church starts out. Some people accept the gospel. They get excited about it. And then the Thessalonian Jews get upset. And then they stir up the ruffians and run Paul out of town. Again, logic. It's natural progression. Gospel comes. It's received. The world doesn't like it. Suffering results. Happens that way a lot. But what Paul says here is switched around. It kind of looks like he's saying that the Thessalonians received the message of the gospel even though they were already being persecuted. That's odd. For in spite of persecution, you receive the word with joy. Which makes me wonder what Paul's getting at. I mean, what kind of persecution or trouble is he thinking of? Because it can't be the suffering that results from being faithful to Jesus, from following Jesus, because that suffering, this, uh, this persecution comes before they're there, before they receive the word. So what could it have been? I don't make too much of this, but there's the possibility it could have been doubt. It could have been uncertainty, the fear of the unknown. It could have been the fear of a loss of a comfortable way of living. You know, you've heard the, the parable, the bird in the hand, and the, there was worth two in the bush. 